Okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, wel welcome to uh, our final event in the uh, uh, Applied Data Science Invited Talks track. Uh, and this event is a uh, panel that consists of uh, two of our uh, actually invited speakers who spoke earlier this afternoon uh, and uh, s several other guests who are uh, experts uh, in the area we want to, or, or have exposure to the area we want to talk about. And what I really hope is that we'll have a uh, pretty interactive panel session, so I really look to you to ask questions. Um, I'll uh, just share with you uh, personally, um, I've been sort of struggling with and or dealing with this, with, with topics that we hope to discuss today for many years. And I always felt that they haven't, there's, there's been a, a very uh, uh, real pain that is unanswered and has no good solution. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about, you know, how, how do we go about doing sort of machine learning or data science training, modeling, analysis? What are all the things you go through when you do have to go through data preparation, data extraction, selection, et cetera. And my personal experience, whenever I do these uh, sort of modeling sessions, is I wind up you know, intensively looking at a problem, trying out a lot of different options, creating many scripts in the process, extracting you know, parts of the data or new attributes or what have you, and I leave a lot of what I call you know, droppings behind. So all these files that are sort of sitting there mysteriously containing something useful that at the time I fully know what they're about. But often when I come back to it myself two months later or a year later, forget it. I can't even reconstruct what the heck was happening. Uh, what did I do? Um, and I started feeling this pain in reality when I started running my own startups or trying to build... Uh, big organizations with data scientists in them. Uh, as you probably all know, uh, data scientists are some of the uh, hottest positions out there today. So they get the highest paid salaries, etc. So imagine yourself a company, big or small. Uh, small ones are really big victims of this uh, disease. Uh, you go through the motions and effort, you hire a data scientist, you invest in them, they do a bunch of this stuff with the extraction and droppings and you know somehow black magic, and they get some model going. And then this highly paid individual gets another job offer uh, at an even higher uh, paid salary at another company and bids you farewell. Uh, now, good luck finding another one in high demand, but then when you find another data scientist, they come in, and uh, of course they have no clue what the previous data scientist did. How do I even repeat what they did? I don't even know how that model was built, so I need to build a whole new thing from scratch because I can't never refresh this model for you because I really don't understand how it's being built. Um, the other big question I've had, which is also important, is how do we compare algorithms in the community? I mean, this is a data-intensive community. You know, in many ways, shame on us, right? Uh, the database field has, you know, transaction, uh, you know, benchmarks, they have analytical benchmarks, they have a bunch of query loads that they test, they measure performance, they can compare stuff meaningfully. Uh, every other engineering discipline I know of has benchmarks. Uh, in this community where data is so important and performance is so important, we don't have those. So for example, one of my big pet peeves these days, like you know, a lot of you, for example, know about deep learning. Uh, you know, deep learning involves a heck of a lot of customizations and so forth. Uh, when it's time to compare it, well, how do I measure all the customizations that happened? How do I quantify all the computation that got burned in order to create this model and then compare it to a model with a decision tree that takes, you know, three milliseconds to build and then say, oh, this thing far outperforms, uh, right? 
from, from an accuracy perspective. So those metrics, that normalization, it doesn't really exist in our industry, and we don't think uh, deep enough about it. Hopefully, you guys will come up with other questions. I have posted on the blog uh, a bunch of questions that I plan to be asking uh, the panelists. Uh, my plan is to go through some of those questions, but I want to stop at any time when you guys have a question and take questions from you and directions from you. Uh, I really want this to be a, a high participation uh, panel. So with that small introduction, um, I'd like to now turn it over and ask uh, each of our uh, panelists to basically introduce themselves. I don't want to, rather than me talking about their backgrounds, uh, I want them to talk to, to you about their backgrounds, why they are here, what they hope to get out of their panel. So uh, if we turn it around, maybe Arno, you can, you can get started and tell us who you are, what you do, and uh, what you hope to get from this panel. And anything else about your history you should know about. All right. Well, thank you for having us here. It's an exciting time to be in this field of machine learning. I joined that field in 2011 after doing six years of particle accelerator physics at SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator. And that was after my PhD in physics at ETH in Switzerland, in Zurich. So when I joined the machine learning field, uh, we started doing C++, distributed and all that. So I was one of those core algorithm engineers. Now I'm the CTO of H2O AI. It's a company that does uh, open source machine learning, data science, and we are um, known for speed and accuracy, kind of, but it's also, it, it's, our goal is to democratize data science. So I'm, I'm pushing that frontier with GPUs, with all kinds of automatic um, magic going on. Kaggle is one of our top projects, so we're blending all these pieces. But still, this management uh, issue is, is not easy to handle, even for our internal development, sometimes we don't know what we're doing or who did what. So it's definitely a, a sorely needed thing to keep track of what you're doing. And I work with the top top 10 Kagglers in the world, and all they do is keep track of what they did, right? It's actually a secret. Do that, and you'll be uh, well ahead of the game. So what, what do you hope to get out of this panel? Um, at the end of these uh, 90 minutes or so, we'll all probably know a little bit more about the issues we should look at. And I really hope to see from you what is the most important aspects that you are looking for answers for. So I want to hear you guys ask questions. OK. Uh, Eduardo. Uh, yes, hello, everybody. So uh, I'm Eduardo Arino de la Rubia. Uh, I am the. For the purposes of this panel, I'm the chief data scientist at Domino Data Lab. Uh, I got into this industry, uh, a lot of it by coincidence. I happened to be at a university that happened to have a professor who, she was very, very interested in machine learning, and I happened to be an interested student, and she basically opened my eyes to this idea that there existed a class of problems for which we didn't know an answer, but it didn't matter because we could still get an answer, and this was absolutely fascinating to me. Uh, I spent uh, about a decade at a company called Ingram working on how do you apply machine learning in a business where you're making fractional bits of a penny with every single transaction and what does it mean to actually optimize when like basically when your when your margin is really on the edge like that um, let's see uh, what else can I tell uh, so uh, I think I'm the only person on this panel without a PhD uh, I am a practitioner. Uh, very When I started out in this field, actually, it was really considered a taboo to get into machine learning. It was, you know, it was the tail end of the AI winter, and if you wanted to do something useful with yourself, learn that web thing. Like, that's the future, not this crazy academic machine learning thing. Uh, I've never been good at taking advice, and I think it's paid off. Uh, what I plan on getting out of this panel, um, First and foremost, it's a privilege and an honor to be on a panel with these folks, and I literally, like, I, I, I want to, to either be where you're sitting or I want it to be here to understand how some of the sharpest minds in this field sort of think about it. Uh, and I also was hoping to get a good argument because I really love a good argument. Okay. Great. So, Szilard? Hello. <clears throat> I'm Szilard Pavka. I'm the chief scientist at Epoch. Uh, Craig Card Processing Company in Santa Monica, California. Uh, I've been there for 11 years. I've been their first data scientist. So when they hired me 11 years ago, they asked me to look at data and make them more money. That was basically my job description. 
And uh, that was before we called this data science. So I've been working on various things, kind of uh, like a full stack data scientist. Uh, so machine learning for fraud detection, but also other things that are not machine learning, like creating dashboards, uh, working on data infrastructure, even managing like a data warehouse project, doing analysis, um, and uh, advising CEOs, COOs on uh, strategic issues and also on uh, op operational issues. So everything we could get out of, of data. So I've been almost some kind of internal consultant for, for, for executives. Uh, I've been also running a couple of meetups in Los Angeles, and uh, uh, lately I'm teaching part-time at two graduate uh, level uh, courses in, uh, at two universities at UCLA, at, at CU in Europe. And prior to all this, uh, I got a physics PhD, and I've been sucked into finance, so I've been a quant for a number of years. So. What I'd like to get out of this panel is kind of to put forward a few questions for the industry to solve and to see how we can solve them. Thanks. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chung Yun Lee, uh, technical evangelist at Microsoft, uh, where I uh, help um, our clients and community uh, leverage machine learning technology to solve uh, interesting problems they face. Uh, prior to Microsoft, um, I was a chief data scientist at uh, Conversion Logic, where I built a marketing attribution platform for uh, enterprise uh, clients. Um, I started my career um, early um, year 2000 as a uh, network system engineer. Uh, and then uh, I got hooked uh, into um, computer science and um, machine learning and um, pursued my PhD uh, at USC. Um, and after that, uh, I um, just dive into uh, the area of uh, data science. And um, other than my professional career, uh, I'm more well known as uh, my um, competition career. Uh, so um, I'm a, a very active um, a competitioner uh, at Kaggle and other data science competitions. I have participated in over 70 data science competitions past six years, um, won uh, six times, including KDE Cup 2012 and 2015, um, finished top 10 uh, eight times, and I was um, top 10 Kegglers back in 2015, not anymore. Um, um, and um, I'd like to... Uh, uh, today, I'd like to uh, uh, have really candid uh, conversation around challenges and uh, best practice uh, we have in our day-to-day uh, -day data science uh, project management. Um, so, yeah, thank you for having me. So, uh, Jong Yoon is, is a, uh, basically he's the Iron Man of uh, data science, <laughs> <laughs> competitive data science. Uh, Anthony? Hi, I'm Anthony Trong. I'm the CEO of uh, Kazi. Uh, Kazi is a company that builds data analysis software. Uh, we help automate a lot of the data science process by building predictive models. And on top of that, we've built an intelligence to help select, you know, for a specific business context, what is the right approach or what right algorithm uh, to kind of go after. Um, I, <laughs> and I think Eduardo, I think the one other person on this, this panel who does not have a PhD. So uh, prior to this, was work, I was heading up the data science team in an ad tech company. Uh, where you know you, I think we've seen these classic problems of collecting tons of data and having somewhat insufficient software or skills and time really to dive into all the problems that that we could potentially be exploring. Um, and you know I guess really uh, first off I, I echo a lot of what you were saying, Eduardo. Like thank you, Osama, for for organizing this panel and stuff. This is really you know, an honor to to be here and and be with, with all of you guys. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll, I'll be uh, looking for a fight as well, or an argument over this as, as, as well. So definitely looking forward to it. OK, so let me, let me start with a question to, to all of you first, um, and then we'll go with uh, uh, targeted questions. So would, uh, would each of you care to share with us the top two or three most controversial issues you have to deal with in sort of your activities and or your business uh, when it comes to data science? We'll restrict it to data science. 
So, uh, Arno, and it doesn't have to be long. I mean, very quick here so that we can move to questions. Yeah, so I'm known as the guy who writes the algorithms. I know all the parameters and what they mean and all that. So I have a lot of people coming to me saying, why is this not working, right? And I always have to say, well, this is this parameter setting. It's actually it like means this internally and it's all complicated. So I would say controversial is what settings you should be using for what algorithm. It's definitely not easy to do it all right. And even if it's right, what does it mean, right? It might just be better for this particular holdout set. And that brings me to the second point. What's the validation scheme that you're using when you're building models? Like, how do you know it's a good model? Just because it works on this one test set doesn't mean anything, right? The test set could be just a lucky draw, let's say, or it could be last week's data, but it won't be the same as next week's data. So I would say validation scheme, if you can nail that one down, you'll be on a good path. And then obviously, once you have that scheme in place, then build good models. And those two things is what matters. The third thing maybe you could say is what platform should you run on, CPU versus GPU versus TPU versus cloud versus on-prem, whatever, but it's mostly a, a, just a matter of convenience. If it works, it works. So the things that annoy me the most is the fact that it seems that the, org that the body that is data scientists have a terrible, terrible time of explaining to anyone what ROI they actually provide. Uh, it's easy for data scientists to talk about what algorithms they're using or to argue about whether Python sucks or R is awesome or whatever, but actually discussing how they added value and they added incremental marginal value, fundamentally there's no actual rule of thumb. How do you even convey to the business that you're doing a good job or that what you do matters or that you're better than a coin flip on most days? Uh, the second thing that I think is a completely unsolved problem is we literally don't know how to like organize data science functions. Do you have a center of excellence model? Do you have embedded products? Do you use tribes? Does it make sense to have people rotate in and out? Do you need data engineers or should everybody be data scientists? I mean, literally, we, we've known how to organize work teams since there's been like one guy with a pointy stick to make three people work for him. And like we have absolutely no idea how to do this in a scalable, reasonable way, which leads to the problem of actually showing ROI and actually proving why investing in this field makes sense for organizations other than FOMO. FOMO being? Fear of missing out. Yes. <laughs> so I have uh, three controversial issues. One is hype. The second one is hype. And the third one is hype. So I'm not fighting hype in um, my company. So when I'm talking about hype, I'm talking about mostly about hype uh, related to tools and infrastructure. So this has been a number of years ago Hadoop, now later Spark, and now it's deep learning and AI. So I'm kind of lucky that in my company I could save them from Hadoop and from Spark, and I can tell them now that I saved you guys more than a million dollars just on not buying that servers for the cluster. Um, so uh, I talked to, I, I, I've been organizing meetups for almost 10 years, and I talked to a lot of people in LA uh, working in different data science related roles, and I heard really crazy stories about uh, companies getting into Hadoop and uh, uh, having Horton Works come out there and uh, buying into Hadoop when their total size of all their data in the database was like 10 gigabytes. So I'm, yeah, so this is when, when I'm talking about uh, hype kind of annoys me. <laughs> all right, um, so first controversy um, I face day to day uh, is more data is better. Um, so people tend to believe that um, by injecting more data to the system or your model, um, uh, people expect to get uh, better performance. Uh, but the truth is, uh, open cases, um, more data uh, will help only if you have a certain problem. Let's say uh, you have like a high variance problem where your uh, model is overfitting to the training data. In that case, um, adding more data will definitely help, but open times is not the uh, case. So um, uh, like uh, famously, uh, Xavier Amatria um, uh, pointed out uh, multiple times uh, by showing that at Netflix, uh, the production uh, model performance stopped stopped uh, improving uh, 
uh, only after having like a couple of hundreds of thousand uh, records when tested up to like six million records. And likewise, uh, Twitter also uh, published uh, their uh, research results back in 2012 at Sigmod, uh, showing that um, uh, their uh, sentimental, uh, sentiment analysis model uh, stopped improving or marginally, uh, only marginally improved by uh, increasing the amount of training data set by 10 times from 1 million um, to 10 million and 10 million to 100 million. So uh, before I uh, try to build up uh, like a big data pipeline uh, for model training, you really need to think twice or uh, multiple times uh, to see whether it's really uh, necessary uh, to uh, achieve like the best result. Probably not, uh, like uh, over 50% uh, cases are probably not. And second controversy uh, I face like over and over again uh, is uh, the matter of uh, interpretability. So um, uh, Claudia uh, Pellich at uh, Distillery um, pointed out uh, uh, that by definition, um, one cannot understand a good model. Because uh, if uh, think about uh, you are, are having a conversation with uh, like uh, particle physicist, and uh, he's explaining like uh, 11 different dimensions and uh, uh, et cetera. And um, your, if your mental capability is not uh, at that level, you won't be able to understand everything he says, every, uh, everything he delivers. Likewise, how, uh, how come you expect to understand every single bit of like uh, predictions or uh, operations within uh, cutting edge machine learning algorithms. If you believe that machine learning algorithm is really good, really uh, superior. Um, so um, also um, in addition to that, um, the interpretability of linear models, the simplest models are overestimated or uh, overvalued. For example, if you have like uh, millions of uh, variables uh, such as in uh, click through rate estimation, yeah, good luck with uh, to uh, explain um, or interpret the results or uh, coefficients. Or uh, if your features uh, are uh, collinear, or if you have like interaction terms uh, in your uh, linear model, then it becomes really tricky to uh, interpret or understand what's really going on, uh, even within linear model. So if you want, uh, at the end of the day, um, I believe that uh, what matters is the metric, uh, like ROI, as Edward mentioned. So if you have ROI uh, to optimize or metric of interest, then uh, what you need to do is really uh, setting up a good model validation framework. And as long as you can trust the model, then um, you can um, let the model optimize for uh, the metric of interest or ROI of interest. So there's okay. two controversies. Yeah. Anthony? Yeah, I think uh, maybe adding on a little bit to what you're saying, I think one of the most bewildering things to me is that the business context of a lot of, a lot of the reason we build predictive models seems completely divorced in our industry from the actual model creation. And you know, I think it's one thing to, to talk about something like ROI is a specific end goal that we have well-defined. But I think if you look at any business, even what your main metric is or what you are trying to do is a shifting target. You know, if take an advertising example, in some cases I might really be looking at getting the best price performance. In other cases, I want to spend the entirety of my budget. And I think it's very strange to me that modeling today, especially in most practice, is, is kind of bifurcated as, you know, here's the modeling practice that we do, and separately, here's maybe a specific kind of ROI goal that I might have uh, independent of that. I think really where the industry needs to change this mentality is start coupling these two together. You know, not just codifying how is my model performing, what is the specifics of you know, this individual model performance and accuracy, but also what particular problems is coupled to, are we using the right model for a particular uh, kind of applications or whatever. Um, and I think the other thing also is it's, it's very strange to, another bewildering thing is that 
we don't codify or spend nearly enough time codifying how we do simple decisions and modeling today. And you look at any organization, you know, Osama was, was starting out with this, you get this huge key man risk when you, it's all stuck in someone's mind. But, but even before you get to the key man risk side, you can, I, I really firmly believe that you know, what you can measure, you can improve. If I don't know how my organization is making decisions or how we're making models, it's always gonna be a game of starting from scratch again and again and again. And that's really great for preserving this type of data science practice that we have today. But I don't believe for a second that that's really the, the way in the future where organizations that are really adaptive to data science are really gonna start uh, improving. You know, we, we need to capture more of how just even simple decisions are, are being made today. Okay. All right, so now we have a, a collection of uh, what these, what these uh, folks view as their sort of big daily controversial issues. I wanna move over, and by the way, if you have questions, raise your hand at any time and we'll, we'll get you a microphone. I wanna move over and ask, uh, I'll start with uh, Szilard, actually. Um, so let's start with the benchmarks. You know, what's, what's the state of the field, uh, in your opinion, in terms of benchmark, and uh, why is there a lack of it, you know, a lack of that, and then also, what should we be doing to fix it? Yeah, excellent question. Thank you for inviting me, not only to this panel, but also uh, I had a talk uh, about two hours ago here, so I see a lot of you haven't been to my talk, so uh, I'm gonna summarize a little bit, just in like two minutes, uh, uh, what I was saying there. So basically this started for me as some kind of question I wanted to use uh, an open source tool for machine learning doing uh, binary classification on uh, not so big data, so something like of the order of uh, 10 million records. And I thought this would be like an afternoon project, just uh, look at various open source tools that are, were available. This was about two years ago. And uh, I've been doing this for a number of years and before, like let's say 10 years ago, there was no tool that could uh, solve that problem that I tried to solve two years ago. But two years ago, I saw that there must be open source tools now that, that can solve that kind of a problem. So uh, it took a little bit more than just an afternoon project. And here the bottleneck was like, 10 years ago, there was no really a tool that you could run on one single server that would do binary classification on, let's say, a random forest or the GBM uh, on 10 million records. But uh, two years ago, I was able to pick the most uh, widely used uh, open source tools, which I saw based on discussion with friends and looking up Kaggle forums and so on. There were several R packages, Python packages, XGBoost, H2O, um, and Spark, MLlib. So um, I look at several algorithms. So Rich Caruana had has a very great paper, actually two papers from his group from 2006, but they are absolutely not outdated. So they've been looking at like a, more than a dozen data sets, a dozen algorithms, and which are the most accurate. And it came out that uh, basically you are good to go if you just look at like random forest, GBM, uh, support vector machines, neural networks, and maybe logistic regression. Uh, so I looked at various implementation of these algorithms, and I looked at uh, first what used to be some kind of bottleneck is that you couldn't even run because you didn't have enough RAM to run it. So one is like the memory footprint. I was interested. The other one is the speed. So uh, how much training time you need to run this, and uh, not ultimately, but the accuracy and. This was not Kaggle. So in Kaggle, basically, you're optimizing to the fifth digit of the accuracy, uh, assuming that you have unbound computational resources, so nobody cares if you're running it for, on like uh, 100 servers for many, many days. So I want something that runs in decent time on one server with decent memory footprint, and it gives you maybe not that accurate as, as a Kaggle winner, but, but close to it. So 
I have this GitHub repo uh, that's you, all this work is is in the open, so you can look at it. It's reproducible. It, unfortunately, it's only one data set, so I picked the airline data set that it's public, but it has kind of similar structure like, let's say, churn or fraud detection data that's like a mix of uh, categorical and numeric variables. And uh, what comes as a surprise is that you would think that everyone implements the same uh, textbook algorithm, let's say for random forest, but there is like 10x and even 100x difference between memory usage and also between running training time between various tools. So uh, the best tools are the ones that have been optimized with various uh, low level hardware, close to hardware tricks like how to how to deal with the data in such a way that you keep you you keep it as much in CPU caches as as possible, so you can get like 10x improvement with that. So I'm not talking about like 20% faster or 30% faster. I'm talking about 10x faster or even 100x faster, and same for like memory footprints. So in one case it might run for an hour, in the other case it might run for days, so it's not the same. Also, if you use 10x or 100x RAM, it might not fit even if you have a lot of memory. So this, well, this benchmark I did, it's kind of very limited and incomplete, and I make all kind of disclaimers. Uh, it's also on one data set, so I presented in my presentation kind of my wish list of uh, what would be nice to have to make this uh, like more broad and more believable. So I think the strongest point is that I'm kind of a user and I'm independent of all the vendors making the open source tools. And I looked also at a few commercial tools. So maybe that makes it more believable. But but still, there are, I mean, it's still one data set. It's not automated, so it would be nice uh, to have something that you can run it almost automatically if uh, a tool gets upgraded. And uh, there are a lot of things we, we, we can make more, this more serious. But, but to answer the question, what we need to do is probably we uh, need to have something like the database community has the TPCDS, uh, for example, which is as far as I understood, it's kind of like a consortium putting out this is the data, this is the problem, solve it. And that it's a little bit more easy to solve than machine learning because it's SQL. So it's kind of, you need to get like a deterministic answer and then it matters how fast you get. So here in machine learning, if we want benchmarks, we'll have still this kind of trade-off of uh, if I want a little bit more accurate, I might want to run it, I might need to, to, to run it for a longer time so I can give up a little bit of accuracy and get it much faster and this kind of thing. So, I mean, it would be nice to have a discussion about uh, uh, how, how to have this kind of performance benchmarks. And I'm also aware that, so performance is only like a little bit of all those things that really matter for machine learning projects like deployability and reproducibility and all those things. So I, I don't think, I, I'm not claiming that what I'm address is, is, is the most relevant thing. So it's, it's just performance. But when you have like 10x or 100x performance differences between tools, it's good to know which ones uh, uh, not to even take a look and not waste your time. Can I jump in on that? Yeah, please. So I, I used to have a boss that used to say that standards are what all of the companies in second, third, and fourth place try to push. And uh, the fact of the matter is that also that these sort of benchmarks, particularly the database industry benchmarks, are sort of a sign of a industry that is mature that uh, understands that they're now sort of in a race to the bottom, right? Like the database industry is basically trying to figure out how they can get uh, stored data for less and give you slightly more features. I think part of the problem that we have is that this is still a very shockingly from a commercial standpoint, immature industry. 
And so it's actually, you have to, you have to, you know, where are the incentives aligned? Who actually wins if a benchmark is created, right? Usually it's the vendors, but the vendors here are still, uh, you know, basically sorting themselves out to figure out who's actually a winner or not. There's also, the, and, I, and I had to say this, uh, the benchmarks Lard did is great, but I think that in, I think that vendors are overfitting on it, and I actually think that the data set is not a particularly interesting data set. I think most of the interesting problems in data science are incredibly imbalanced problems, where it actually really, really matters how the algorithm treats imbalanced classes, how you optimize, and all of those things. So even a benchmark that was well designed, that had a great framework. Uh, in order to do it right, you have to be able to plug in your own data and you have to be able to actually understand how it performs on your own environment with your own like sampling constraints and all of those things. So uh, it's an incredibly hard problem and we as a commercial industry, I don't think are at a point in maturity where the incentives align for people to actually get answers. If I can add on to that really quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, I think kind of adding on to what you're saying, Eduardo, I think one of the big challenges right now is that a lot of the, the real business applicability of what we're talking about in a commercial industry is settings where individuals or humans fundamentally are the ones setting the benchmark. You know, it's not about um, can we compute this in some amount of time, faster or slower or whatever. It's really that I, as a business user, really want to optimize, in this case, more for um, false positives in churn or false negatives. Or I have this other setting where I need to create a model that has this type of output. I think we're really at a stage still where it's fairly simple that humans are the ones deciding what the most relevant context is, and we need to really capture that relevant context for the model or for the problem that we're trying to solve. And, and I don't think it, it is a world where we should be talking as much about universal benchmarks, but I think the first problem is just figure out what the business context of each problem is so, and what models are. So in defense of Zillard, and I'd love to hear from the audience, and maybe Zillard will defend yeah, himself. I, yeah, I will okay. do. All right. But I was going to say it very briefly. Go yeah, on. I will have to answer to Edward. Yeah. So basically <laughs> what I, I, uh, I tell everyone uh, in my talks is basically don't believe me. So this is on my data. And uh, uh, take my framework and you can easily steal my code from GitHub and just run it on your own data and see, see what happens. Because what, that's what's really relevant. So uh, this yeah. solved my problem, but you might have a different problem. But, but yeah, sure, go steal my code and do it. Yeah, in, in addition, I would say a hallmark of a uh, good benchmark is one that evolves over time, and perhaps in the early stages evolves quickly. I actually think putting a stake in the ground and starting somewhere where we can compare is a big deal. Now, I'm not a panelist, so I shouldn't say this, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Question from the audience, and then we'll come back with... I think uh, when, when choosing a tool like this, speed and accuracy are important, but really the question, uh, at least from, from our side, is uh, which one makes my life the easiest? You know, what, what fits into my tool chain the, the quickest and, and uh, which one is documented the best? And those things are hard to benchmark um, and, and really aren't, are, are kind of particular for each user. Yeah, uh, and the other thing I did mention is that I did this benchmark and I saw which is the fastest tool and I didn't use that one for production <laughs> because of exactly what you were saying. There, there are other dimensions. But I still needed something that passed over something, and there were some tools which you couldn't use it. So just throw out the really bad tools, and then from the best ones that like provide you the minimum thing that you want in that dimension, then choose based on maybe other dimensions. So that's what I ended up doing. Yeah. So uh, this is a wonderful conversation. Um, I went through a little mental exercise when you were talking about what you went through about what it would take to build kind of such a system that would do this kind of benchmarking. And a thing that came to mind, which has been a theme that I've been struggling with myself, is essentially the lack of proper interfaces for all these different systems that are out there. So like one of the things that I encourage to my team is the fact that I don't view data science, I view it as a very immature version of software development, where if we had in software development, you have interfaces, you have clearly defined structure, that isn't there, and I'm curious if you have similar thoughts like that. Absolutely, and uh, my main learning for all this was that if you start looking at a new tool, how often you are gonna use it. So often I put out some numbers and the developers of that tool contacted me and uh, they managed to tweak it just a little, a few parameters change and it, it became like two, three times faster. So it was a lot of learning for me. So 
uh, actually, when I started this, I didn't want to do all this work. So I spent probably like a couple of hours Googling, trying to find if someone has done this before. So I took this on myself, partly because of fun. It was kind of like, I have a PhD in physics, so I like to work on new problems. So I took this as a new problem. But if somebody else would have solved it, then I would just use their results. I know there's there's a question here, but since just a quick follow up on his comments, since this was a question for, for you, Arno, the whole topic of where do I start? Like, okay, I'm a data scientist. What do I grab? You know, what's a standard? What's a, any comments on that? And then yes. we'll go to your question. I highly encourage everyone who has a data set to start with a baseline that's super trivial, right? For example, uh, you can turn every numeric column into a categorical by binning it with percentiles. You can take every categorical and leave it as categorical. And now let's say you have only categoricals left. You can just target and code the categoricals by the mean of the response in each of the groups, right? So for every occupation, you get their mean income, for example. And that is a number, and you're trying to predict the income. So now you have a, um, each column itself can be replaced by this mean per group. And that is a prediction. You don't even need a model. That is the model. That simple replacing of the categorical by its mean per group. And that is a good baseline. And then you can do the same with two-way interactions. So you take occupation and zip code, you stitch it together, group that, and look for doctors in Santa Monica versus doctors in Illinois or whatever, whatever Chicago, or whatever your grouping is, and you figure out what's their income. And that is also a predictive number, right, if you're trying to predict income. And that is a good model. And that actually might beat a random forest just because you're looking very sharply at these groups. And similarly, you can start with a, a linear model or something that's just statistical, like very low key. Don't build a deep learning RNN from the beginning and hope that you're good, right? Because there is usually no such benchmark to start with. So start with the baseline and work yourself up. And as you look at the data, you, you, you learn from it. You see how these interactions matter. Uh, then when you later build a tree model, you can see if that tree model also picks up those interactions that the statistics told you was important. So work your way up from the beginning. And I think the Kagglers of the world would agree with this. Like understand your data first before you go crazy on the, yeah. the machine learning. I mean, the, one of the things that bothers me about the field is that we don't have that sort of starting recipe or how do I go about it or where, you know, what's the appropriate way to approach a, a problem? You had a question? Uh, yes, just to continue discussion about tools and ease of use especially, um, we can see more and more of providers of different tools saying they are democratizing AI, basically implying that um, AI should be available for everyone and machine learning should be possible to do for, for anyone. If you were to look ahead like five years, do you think that will happen? That the majority of people building and deploying machine learning um, solutions are not really data scientists, but people in other fields? No. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to I'll, I'll take, a, I'll take the opposite All side right. of this. I, I think there's, <laughs> there's definitely an element to it. You know, I think there's very simple tasks right now that are dominated by business intelligence. I mean, you look at any user of Tableau, Domo, ClickView, I mean, name your favorite BI tool. You know, everybody who is using a BI tool right now is trying to get some of the basic outputs of essentially what we call data science today. And they're using it in a way where they, they have very similar inputs and they, they putatively want to get some basic predictions out of a lot of these. So, I mean, absolutely, I think that same audience that is uses BI today, that should be replaced by a lot of machine learning. I mean, there, there should be a way to give that type of capability to somebody who is a business owner who is using BI right now. And, and absolutely, I think five years from now, that, that is going to be the future. Is that going to replace the hardcore data scientist who is building, you know, the, the next news feed in, in Facebook and, and making that the most accurate thing in the world? Absolutely not, right? You know, that, that's not really where it is. But I think there's absolutely a huge opportunity to start allowing people who are already doing data-like functions and, and give them much more of the, the 
ability to do that. And I think on top of that, they know much better than most data scientists what the right business context is. I mean, they know that, I mean, if you look at any, I mean, go to the hospital, right? You look at your favorite doctor, and they don't have to look at petabytes of data to say, hey, you've got atrial fibrillation, and you're about to die. With much less data, they're able to make some sort of decision right now. And I think if you can start codifying a lot more of how are these decisions made, that's, that's where you have a lot of ripe opportunity. And I think that's areas where we're already making decisions off of data, whether we acknowledge it or not. Maybe not in classic data science sense, but that's, that's where there's a ton of opportunity. What was that, another question there? Yeah. Yes, uh, so basically a benchmark is comparing different algorithms uh, uh, using different tools on these kind of benchmark data, right? So as an end user, so we look at the benchmark comparison to decide what tools to, cho to choose, right? So, but uh, some data set, from the personal perspective, you might be familiar with, some, comfortable with some tools, not comfortable with other tools, right? So what's your, from your personal experience, how much performance gain you want to get in order to switch from a tool you are comfortable with to another one that you are not comfortable with? So I can tell you from first-hand experience, I developed the Java-based uh, C, um, uh, CPU-based code base for each tool, right? I'm, I'm the number one committer, and I love my code, let's say. And I still now i am writing only GPU codes going forward because GPUs make it 10x faster, and that's if you do a lousy job. So if you do a good job, you can be 30 times faster. So just giving you that idea that switching is doable if, if you see a, an order of magnitude. Now, can I solve the same size problems on a single GPU as on a single CPU? No, but many problems will fit into a GPUs, right? Which is 128 gigabytes. So rethinking to just learn that new tool. How hard can it be to write some Python? Probably not too hard. So I would say keep your brains open to changing a little bit. And I think the best thing you can do is to play on Kaggle or something like it just as a, as a one hour a week thing, just to keep yourself open-minded to the evolution of new tools. Because this field is changing so fast. Uh, 10 years ago, everybody would have told you just keep SVMs around, right? You don't need neural nets and all that. And now it's completely different. So. Um, I would say the barrier to entry is going lower and lower because of Python and R and all these programming languages. And every tool provider like us, we have to write Python APIs, right? It's not going to be C++. Not many users will use that. And maybe to the other question earlier, maybe in a few years, everything will be through Excel, right? You just upload your 10 million rows and you say, make this column full and that's it. And Google already does that. And it's not, not hard to do. It's just a question of, how many guarantees do you want to give when you make that prediction, right? What's your error estimate, confidence interval? You can't just predict the number and somebody goes and buys the wrong house based on that or something. <laughs> like, you have to be a little bit careful, so. I mean, you're, there's a question back there, but your, uh, your mention of Excel, I, I must share my Excel story. <laughs> in, in 1997, I was at Microsoft, and I was so hot on embedding data mining into Excel I went to the head of that group, Steve Sanofsky at the time, and I pitched him for 45 minutes on how data mining can work, and you can select columns and you know, automatically reduce, blah, blah, blah. He's listening to me and being very polite, because he usually is not. <laughs> and then he turns around and says, Osama, do you know how many users of Excel use Excel with a calculator on the side? Because they don't know there's a plus function in there. <laughs> anyway. So uh, there was a question. OK, back there. Uh, my my question is um, about deployment or just deployment in in general. Um, but you know, I'm in the healthcare sector, and w there's now lots of algorithms. And the problem is deployment, where we want to put algorithms in hundreds of different hospitals or dozens of different EMR systems, uh, and um, and it's not ha it hasn't been hap like we ha you know there's thousands of algorithms, hundreds of algorithms, um, and uh, deployment's a real a real problem. Uh, and now that the algorithms are getting more complex um, deployments being even harder, and in my experience, most of the time people, you know, hand code, uh, recalculate the, the algorithms in their systems, uh, and so, and I'm not sure if it's a, it's a, if there's common use cases like, you know, I sort of think Visa doesn't have to run their fraud detection in Mastercard or, 
or am, you know, Amazon Books definitely hasn't run their algorithms in Google Books. But is, it, is this a problem that you guys see or, and, any, and any thoughts? I think, Eduardo, you probably have something to say about this since well, this was your job for many years. Boy, howdy do I. <laughs> um, so, so let's take a step back. I think that there's three, and y'all correct me if you disagree with this, I think there's three main sort of approaches to deploying the output of a data science process into the business. Approach number one is you build a model, you then somehow turn it into an Excel spreadsheet, you stick it in a JIRA issue, and then 10 months later the engineering team deploys something that is a screwed up version of the thing that you tried to build. And I think that that is, I don't know, 60 to 70% of the deployment strategies in the world. Uh, I think the next version is uh, the engineering team is given a spec for some sort of microservice that they are told to call out to. And the, there are two different engineering teams, and one of them builds a microservice infrastructure that the other team calls into. The microservice infrastructure goes down because nobody knows how to build microservices. And then you end up with some badly implemented internal version that is the fallback version that ends up being the hot path. And I think <clears throat> the third version is the only version that actually like works. And it's when from the ground up, your engineering uh, is built such that a component of the engineering pipeline knows to call into some machine learning build system to literally extract a model, build it in, go through a validation subsystem, and actually understand it becomes a first class citizen of the software itself. Uh, I think that those are the three primary approaches. Right. Uh, so I didn't say that one because literally no one does that. Well, that's my that's what my <laughs> that's what it seems. But like when we've been using it and and talking with uh, the hospital teams, uh, you know, I think they're they're they, they they get the idea. They're receptive, but it's just my sense is that people aren't aren't using them. Yeah. So for for PMML to like let let's think about the business incentives, right? Like for PMML to matter. Companies that build algorithms need to be willing to go, don't worry, our algorithm is like, just it happens behind the scenes and you just like can plug in whatever thing behind. That's not like, that's not how business works. That's not how the teams that are paid to develop these algorithms work, right? Like they want you to ship their product because then your product becomes part of their ecosystem and then they can like make money so they can afford food and stuff, right? Uh, PMML is a fantastic idea, but uh, I mean, uh, I, I don't know of anyone actually running it in production in, in, in a real sense. Uh, like, you? Cool. You're the one dude raising his hand. <laughs> like, that's it. It's you, man. I've, I've used it in production, too. Okay, cool. <laughs> there, there's two of y'all. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, uh, so, but, but, but the point I'm making is that this is a completely unsolved problem. But it's actually not even the interesting problem to me. The interesting problem to me is you have a machine learning model in production. That machine learning model needs to be retrained over time. Your database schema keeps changing. Like stuff happens, covariates shift in the world. Your entire pipeline needs to be a thing of some sort. Oh, and by the way, six months later, a regulator is gonna come up to you and go, hey, why did your model tell you that you needed to give this person 50 cc's of blah, 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 blah. And you have to figure out like, Wait, what model were we running? Who trained that model? What was the data? Like, what is our liability? What is our coverage? The idea to me that is critical is that you have to tie the deployment pipeline to the exploratory pipeline, and you need to have this in one sort of united idea. And I, I don't think PMML solves that problem. No. I think that there's very few people that are even sort of addressing the problem. And to me, that's the grand challenge problem of getting machine learning into production sustainably and reliably. That's a good point. So we, we will go, is your question directly related? I'll ask a question and then we go to you. No. I'll wait for you. All right, yeah. so let me ask a question to uh, Jong Yoon actually. Uh, it's a two part uh, question. The first one is, is very quick. How the heck have you managed to work on over 70 data science competitions in addition to a full time employment at work the past six years? But more seriously, what have you learned from all these experiences? You're, you're an active, uh, you know, participant on Kaggle, you're in competitions all the time. Are competitions good for the field or are they just distractions from the real problems? Okay, uh, this is my favorite topic. I can go like all day long, but um, so no, no. first and, of and all- Answer in a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so first of all, um, I really enjoy uh, working on competitions. So um, I love to um, uh, interact with uh, other data scientists across the world. Uh, uh, to, I love to learn from them. I love to uh, learn new algorithms, new tools, and new approaches, uh, etc. So instead of like playing golf or watching movies, 
I do Kaggle. I, I work on competitions. That's my hobby. So, but uh, still, um, uh, even uh, to spend time on uh, what you really like, uh, you really need to carve out uh, your resource um, because of other responsibilities at uh, work and at family. By the way, um, I have four little ones under the age of five, uh, so um, you can guess how busy uh, I am. Um, Do they go to watch you in competitions? <laughs> uh, they help, so that's the concept of ensemble. Ah. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so uh, for me to do well and to really enjoy uh, working on competitions, uh, it all comes down to building or establishing good uh, process uh, in a way that I can reuse the code or uh, project I used in previous competitions and uh, I, uh, something I can build on top of, uh, as well as I need to have a really good uh, framework to log uh, whatever I did before, uh, and I need a really good framework to, uh, collaborate, uh, to collaborate with um, uh, other international um, um, uh, colleagues uh, across the world. Uh, so um, I think it's kind of related uh, to the uh, topic we are discussing now. So not only in real time um, data science practice, but also at uh, Kaggle competitions or any sort of data science uh, related uh, project or process, I believe that uh, uh, building or establishing a solid framework or solid uh, process uh, matters the most. Um, so that's the... So we get it that you love competitions, but are they good for the field? Uh, yeah, so that's the uh, second part. Yeah. And I, as an individual, um, I... Uh, I benefit tremendously from uh, Kaggle. Again, uh, by learning new algorithms, new tools. That's the very first place I can learn latest development of any implementations of machine learning algorithm. But uh, uh, talking about entire field, I still believe that uh, it's really beneficial uh, for the entire field as well. Um, there are two folds, uh, two uh, prospects, uh, uh, two perspectives. So one for the field that hasn't been utilizing uh, machine learning technologies, such as like uh, cosm cosmology or uh, particle physics. So there, there were um, one competition in uh, particle physics called the Higgs boson uh, challenge in 2013, and one, one competition uh, in cosmology uh, image analysis called the dark, dark matter uh, mapping competitions. And both were um, really uh, acknowledged by the whole community uh, as a, a big breakthrough to the field. So if you go to NASA webpage, they acknowledge uh, the uh, winning solution of dark matter uh, competition um, as a like, breakthrough in decades. Yeah. So uh, that's one aspect. Uh, but uh, also for the field that has been using machine learning uh, intensively, like EdTech. Uh, I often observe that even uh, challenges around uh, um, ad tech uh, fields, uh, they still uh, benefit from like new findings from challenges. Like uh, there has been a couple of uh, multiple click-through rate uh, prediction challenges at Kaggle, and um, uh, that was where we um, identified uh, like new uh, or better algorithm to apply on a click-through rate problem, like a field-aware uh, factorization machine, which uh, outperformed any uh, single uh, algorithm out there uh, by significant margin. So um, for the field uh, that, uh, that has been utilizing the, um, uh, either a field that has been utilizing machine learning technology or the field that has uh, been utilizing machine learning field, competition can be the way to see what's possible with the data set you have and uh, what's possible with the latest development in machine learning uh, technology. Yeah, and for the record, I think KDD Cup has been great for the KDD community as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, driving a lot of insights. So your question. I'm going to ask a rather boring question, and it's an open oh, question. Let's skip it. <laughs> <laughs> it's boring. Uh, a challenge I've often faced is, um, you know, should we espouse uh, principles such as agile when trying to embed data science within commercial organizations? 
And if so, you know, um, the thing that I've often struggled with is, is with how do we do justice to a problem? Because, uh, you know, the instruction I've often had is, you know, we're okay as long as we're 80% of the way there. How do you know you're 80% of the way there? Agile versus not agile. Any takers? Yeah? So I, again, have an opinion. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, agile is a software methodology that works for certain kinds of software, sometimes when implemented right in, in a particular environment. Uh, software development is, and software engineering asks how questions. Data science does not ask how questions. It asks why questions. It asks questions of causality. It asks fundamentally different questions. I think that one of the, uh, at Domino, uh, uh, one, of, one of the like most critical failure modes that I see is organizations that run data science groups as engineering groups. And uh, because what ends up happening is, and I, I don't think this is, uh, this is an extreme position, data science is harder than engineering. And what happens is that when people are run as an engineering discipline, oftentimes what they will do is they will collapse away from answering data science problems because there's lots of dead ends, because it's hard, because you're constantly facing your own incompetence and your own lack of imagination, and they will collapse back into basically solving engineering problems. They'll be like, oh, the problem isn't this. Oh, we need a new queuing system, or our problem is that our log scraper needs to be 15% better. It's like, no, I think that that is an explicitly harmful thing. Now, I'm not talking about organizations that are running ML engineering departments. I'm not talking about organizations that are trying to build better algorithms. Uh, but for organizations that are trying to do the analysis data science pr uh, process, I think that Agile is a critical misfit that'll uh, lead you to create anti-goals. Wow, that's a strong position. Anybody agrees or disagrees on the yeah, panel? Absolutely, I agree. You With agree? Eduardo. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd like to add to uh, Edward's uh, point. So there should they have a, a clear distinctions between two very different types of data science. One is uh, more statistical analysis or regression analysis type of data science work. Uh, the other is uh, machine learning related uh, product development. So uh, the latter uh, is uh, closer to um, more traditional software engineering and um, um, software engineering uh, philosophy or framework such as Agile or Scrum or um, uh, the, the idea can be applied to machine learning related product development. But uh, as Edward pointed out, the data science analysis, uh, statistical analysis or regression analysis is not suitable for uh, that kind of framework. This is, this is one of those moments. I'm not a panelist, but I strongly disagree, but I'm not going to state my opinion. Yeah. I'm an <laughs> ardent believer in agile, unless... <laughs> no, I, I, was, I wasn't necessarily going to say agile or not agile. I, I think maybe taking a step back, if, if you allow me for a second, I, I think the question of Agile versus not agile is kind of the wrong question to be asking. You know, I yeah. think the, the right question is much more around, like, what is the output that you want out of your data science? I mean, is it basically, you know, like John Yoon was, was describing, like a prescription for what we should be doing in our company? Or are you building something that's going to be core into, uh, you know, embedded in your software and it's going to make decisions on what people get served in Facebook's news feed or, you know, what recommendations you get for or whatever. I think the, the engineering implementation and how you do that is all predicated on what the type of problem is. But I think maybe adding on to, I think, really some of the discomfort, uh, if you'll allow me a story really quickly. Is, is anyone here an economist? Or, you know, maybe knows your Nobel Prize winners? Do you know who Bob Lucas is, maybe? Anyone? Yeah. Okay, so, so for those of you who don't, Bob Lucas is a Nobel Prize winning economist, macroeconomist. Uh, and, and in 1976, Bob Lucas gave critique of macroeconomics. And if you think about macroeconomics in this field at that time, as, as some of you may well know, you think about the Federal Reserve chairman of the day. They were kind of the data scientists of that time, in 1976, right? And their jobs were to come up with the prescriptions of what people should be doing in terms of the, the macroeconomy. How should you be creating a policy that's going to change people's behavior? Well, Bob Lucas said we were doing this entire practice wrong. And the reason was, was a fewfold. You know, one was the, the endogeneity kind of thing, where you were basically getting people to create policies that they thought would be static, even as you implemented these policies going into the future. But the other thing was that they, they took the wrong assumptions. You know, you're, you're talking about 
things, you know, especially, and I, I think, suspect that your Agile question was somewhat motivated by this, that even as we change policies and even as we change you know, what recommendations we're giving to people from the results of our data analysis, we expect people's behavior to be constant throughout. Take an advertising example, you know, I, I expect my click-through rate to be relatively similar no matter who I'm targeting. Well, you know, it takes a lot of a day for people to go, I don't want to see this ad anymore. I'm going to totally change the fundamentals of how I'm behaving. And when we structure data science, I think the output and the way we ask these questions should not be at these kind of aggregated levels where we're talking about agile development or some sort of quick modification to these, but we have to take a step back and start going, what are the individual level assumptions that we expect? And if you are agile around those same individual assumptions that are gonna be constant throughout, sure, go ahead. Go ahead and, and revise quickly around that. That's really important, actually. But if, if you're taking as to be constant things that are going to be changing with the output of what you're doing, then it's a different story. And I think we live in kind of that pre-Bob Lucas world of data science today. Okay, there was a question, yes. yes. Um, so, back there. Yeah. Uh, so regarding Agile, I think that Agile is not the right, word, um, right way to deal with it, but um, the group can't go dark. They can't go dark for a month yeah. or a couple, even like a couple of weeks. They have to present something. I fully agree. And so, th so this is, if, if you go dark, then people, people start getting antsy, of like where's the result, where's the result? So having a, the ability, and that's why we put PMML in our pipeline, it allows data scientists to drop in their model, change it up. Um, we have a, we use a, um, we have actually a pretty complex system that we use to, to reload these, these uh, models uh, fairly quickly. Um, but that gives the, so that's sort of the, where Agile would come in. It's like how often can you update this model um, I think you can get, I agree, I think you can get Agile there. I think you can also get Agile in model development, but that's a different discussion. Right. But uh, in, at, the same, at the same time, the data scientist in my group is, the, is also an engineer. They are the ones implementing it in real time with a, with a cost budget. So we talk about like how fast can this, uh, how fast is this uh, going to perform? Um, so in that sense, we, it's all, it is sort of Agile, but it's also, um, Right, but it, they can't go dark. That's the most important part. Yeah. Just when I say that I don't believe in agile, I literally mean like the agile that you get in the book. I think you absolutely have to be agile. You have to have constant communication. You have to have constant cross-functional communication. All, those things are all fantastic, but just not agile. Not every day you have a stand-up. Every day you do this. You're measuring story points. You got your burn-down chart. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. There was a question there before, but we'll we'll give it to her if. Okay. <laughs> so I think the first response to Agile uh, opened the door to my favorite pet peeve, which is interpretability. There was a talk yesterday, I think, from GE on how industrial applications uh, have very specific requirement of interpretability. So if you do image recognition, who cares uh, what feature drew that eyebrow? But uh, if you do prediction that a furnace will flood in the uh, refinery and you want this to be operational, the op operational staff needs to know what's, what will cause that. And even more so when we did this at Honeywell very recently, uh, the requirement was not only to uh, let them know which particular signals went out of whack that make us think the flood is upcoming, but also which of these signals came out, out of line first? So there's uh, areas of application where machine learning needs to yeah. be inter interpretable or else we lose credibility. Can I take that on? Sure. Yeah, yeah uh, so Professor Joshua Bloom uh, mentioned about uh, both uh, how important <coughs> the interpretability uh, is in machine learning but at the same time, he also emphasized that uh, uh, there are fields where 1% gain in efficiency uh, really matters. Like uh, oil industry, for example, uh, that's one of the uh, fields he um, uh, uh, used as an example. Uh, so let's, uh, let me ask uh, this question to you. So you mentioned about uh, build, uh, modeling for refinery. So how, which, if you need to choose one, uh, one model, then which one uh, would you choose? Uh, first model will give you 
uh, like 1% better uh, accuracy in terms of prediction, uh, predicting whether this refinery will go on fire. Oh, and uh, uh, sec uh, with uh, less, uh, with more complexity. And second model, um, let's say, uh, it gives you 1% less accurate uh, predictions on um, uh, how likely the refinery will uh, go on fire, like in next um, hour or so, uh, with uh, less complexity, uh, which people often believe um, uh, that uh, is more interpretable. Um, so let me paint you the picture of the background of this request. Uh, the refinery can shut down if you tell them that the furnace is about to flood and possibly explode. But the shutdown costs a lot of money yes. uh, and pretty much closes the pro production down the stream from that furnace. Uh, if you give them ahead of time, say 20 minutes, before you think it's gonna flood, the reason what's causing it, they may be able to address it. So it's then not the matter of how accurate the prediction is, but how uh, we enable the operators to react. Well, uh, for that one, um, so uh, CLR's benchmark uh, showed that uh, accuracy uh, between uh, simple models such as uh, linear regression versus um, more sophisticated model uh, such as random press, uh, the difference is not, we are not talking about like 1% uh, or 2%. It can be with relatively simple data set, it was 10% difference. And uh, it has been shown over and over again, the best performing uh, model uh, can outperform a simple benchmark model by 20%, uh, 30% in terms of accuracy. So at KD Cup 2015, the winning solution achieved 91% of accuracy uh, AUC score, while over 100 teams staged at 60% of accuracy uh, AUC score. So would you take 60% AUC score uh, model versus Jung Jung, 91%? The, the, the formulation of the problem, and I think, I think it's a valid criticism because the real question here is what if you have a non-uniform cost of a false alarm? Meaning, in some cases, the cost of a false alarm is so high that it may overwhelm. And, and for you to, to even be actionable, somebody needs to understand and believe in your prediction before they can actually act on it. Otherwise, they'll just say, you know what, fine. But, <laughs> I don't believe you, and I'll take a chance. But and I think that's the issue, which is, are our learning algorithms using you know, the realistic, you know, cost functions of what's a false alarm, what's a true positive, et cetera. Yeah, so my point is that uh, uh, there, uh, you can, so you can um, use different um, concept or different things other than interpretability, let's say model validation or confidence interval, model confidence score. So if you have, also you can uh, use um, the, more sophisticated model to uh, forecast or predict uh, based on multiple different scenarios to understand uh, what's going on um, without uh, making it really, uh, without stripping it, stripping it down to really simple uh, formulation or simple algorithm. So let me put it in a different way. Let's say you have two models. One is a random forest and the other one is a linear regression or logistic regression, and they have two ROC curves, right? And let's say that one, the random forest in on, is dominates the linear model for every basically false positives and true positives you want to pick up. So it's basically the more interpretable model is always giving you uh, basically worse false positives. So. I, th I think no, no matter where you pick your threshold, uh, the random forest model will be more accurate than the, so I'm not sure what. No, no, that's true. That's true, except that there's a sociological yeah. and organizational issue, which is yes. if somebody doesn't believe you, they will not act. If they will not act, you, you may hit disaster, despite, <coughs> so it's not pure accuracy. Yeah. Well, uh, if yeah. I may, I think there's, this, if I'm interpreting your question correctly, I think there's kind of a fundamental problem even before you get to the specific accuracy, you know, like that, you're in this constraint where you have multiple objectives, potentially. You know, mm -hmm. One, obviously, is to let's get the most accurate <coughs> prediction of whether something is going to flood. 
And the other side is, well, you have another cost constraint for your business that, hey, we can't be shutting this down all the time, and that you have to balance two entirely different objectives. So I don't think you could possibly just come up with one particular benchmark that's going to be universally optimizing for both of these constraints. And no, so you, I, I think the... You could. Decision theory says you could. The problem is here is also organizational, which is how do you get the right. signal, which then requires understanding. It requires somebody to actually believe you. And, and, and I think that's, right. that's the critical thing, though. I think Which is not modeled by cost functions. By right. And, and, and I don't <laughs> think it's a question of, of necessarily uh, the, the model selection. I think that we, we may be conflating, I think, two yes. different kind of conversations together. Um, one of them, I think, is, is to record the signal of, hey, do you have multiple objectives here? Make very clear that you know, for this business context, it's not just about accuracy. It's also that you have you know, another constraint here. You know, very common in advertising, for example. In advertising, you want to get best cost performance for each individual unit of ads that you're spending. But simultaneously, you want to you know, finish out the entirety of your budget. And those could be mutually conflicting you know, kind of uh, objectives that you need to be able to kind of specify in the same system or the same way that you're deciding between approach. And then the other side, I think, is, you know, and to, maybe more specifically to the interpretability of, of your uh, algorithms, I think there is a strong power to having more interpretable algorithms because in absence of a clear function that you can define well of, hey, this is my exact utility curve or something like that, you need you know, a few more of these approaches to act as an intermediary. Towards that. Arno wants to say something. Yes, so interpretability is that important that our, our next-gen product actually focuses almost entirely on it. So the, the point is to be able to interpret a complicated model. It's not impossible if you build locally, um, appro locally um, good approximations, right? So like Lime, there's also K-Lime. So you could cluster your data. You can cluster it based on good predictors. Let's say you do a gradient boosting model. You find the three most important features, right? You can then make a clustering in that three-dimensional space and then find your seven groups. And then for each, you can build a linear model. So now you have, for each observation, you can figure out which group it belongs to, and then you can see what's the local derivative at the point of prediction for that observation. And if that guy is saying high probability for uh, flooding, you can ask, well, which slope is going haywire? So there are some ways to address this, even if the model actually inside was maybe making neural net features and XGBoost and ensembling and all that. You just build a surrogate model, which is this locally linear uh, model in some cluster. And you can go to extremes to build these, these local models, right? As long as they um, shadow what the original model is doing. So you just have to be able to build a model that's interpretable on top of the not interpretable model. And it doesn't have to be the same for every point. You can make a special model for each point if you want, as long as you know how it's behaving. So these local model interpretations are coming up strongly these days. And I think there's ways to figure out what's going on. In the worst case, you can always say, oh, the good model says it's going to flood. And then let's look at the other models and see what they would have said exactly. at this point. So you don't have to just pick one or the other. Right. Hmm. So we have a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it I don't know whether we still want to go back to the Agile question, because that's where I want, want to go. <laughs> well, it seems to be a very um, uh, popular topic. So. I, I, I want to kind of ask the question to the panel and then argue a little bit afterwards about whether uh, there is value in process models for data science and what would be their structure. And I want to argue for some of the Agile stuff there, right? Because to me, Agile solves this problem of we as a society haven't figured out how to do software development. So we always fail at it unless we look at individual artifacts along the way. Data science is even worse. In many places outside of the big companies that have figured out how to do data science, it's that magic bullet, that brain in the picture somewhere, that, that cloud that solves all of your problems and is AI. And the decision makers, the ultimate consumer of it has no clue whatsoever, how do I evaluate it unless they have seen an example? So and that, to me, is the value of Agile. So if they see an example at the end of every sprint, which could be one week, two week, whatever, they start to criticize what, you, what they actually see and what they actually want. And that, to me, is the big value. And that should be a component of whatever process model we come up with. And I'd like to get some perspective on that. Well, we heard the, the panel. They, they, they're not big believers in Agile. I am. Actually, I, I, I ran practices several times in my life where I actually run it full agile with burn down charts and sprints and believe it or not you go through the process between you know understanding the data feature selection etc 
And you iterate. You just have to iterate. And that's part of it. And in, in, in agile, in software development, that's called refactoring, right? We just do a lot of refactoring. Anyway, I, I, uh, I apologize for transgressing my rights. I'm not a panelist. <laughs> but any, any comments to the question? Or any revision of opinion on Agile? <laughs> I, I haven't given my opinion yet. Ah, so all right, all right. Early feedback is good, and <laughs> more feedback is always better, right? So even Silla's work for us was good feedback, right? So if there was something we were slow at, we would make it faster. And the same is true for any communication between anyone. We have people all over the world that they, they, they talk to us on a Slack channel somewhere, and that's maybe not quite agile, but it's agile to me, right? We talk and we figure out what's going on and we discuss and we'll move on from there. So you just have to communicate. But I think it's more important to have good people than to have a lot of people, because if you have communication between a lot of people, it can get chatty. And I don't like chattiness. It usually drowns everything. So make sure you have good quality feedback. So, um as we saw uh, at lunch uh, today, um, the chart talking about uh, machine learning versus data science, data mining, deep learning, AI. Um, in smaller comp smaller and medium companies especially, it's easy for stakeholders to get really confused of what's what and what's hot now and what's not. Um, and I only use that as a preface because even if you built an amazing model, a perfect model, if your business feature is not, your incentive is not effective, a great model can do really poorly when coupled with the feature. So um, have you guys experienced this in, in, in business or, or, or in industry? And um, how do you combat against that? How do you continue to get impact out of data science um, when you're not exactly sure whether it's the data science or whatever you want to call it um, or, or whatever features coupled with it? And just to answer your question, I think the instincts are absolutely right. You know, the, uh, I think a lot of organizations have to first figure out what is the objective that I want to solve using you know, whatever modeling approach or whatever. Like, take a very simple example. Um, if you are doing marketing and trying to figure out which people are really likely to buy and do I want to uh, kind of go after, I think it's always important first to figure out what the kind of context of your problem is. I mean, it's way more important than algorithmic approach or way more important than you know, what type of way am I kind of solving the problem or kind of uh, you know, al I mean, algorithm or whatever, you know, really. You first have to set that context. And I think that's, that's kind of the critical question for any organization to kind of solve any of, of these things. And I think the first ability to like, just figure out how does your data science or whatever you want to call it, data mining, uh, kind of practice fall in, and, and I think figuring out really how you embed the decisions is really the critical bit. I mean, I think that's really where most people are, are really lacking right now, that we, we rush towards, oh, I can create a very accurate model, but we haven't really figured out as much, how are we embedding this in the business practice? Is this something where once every three years a data scientist comes up with the best marketing model, and then we just kind of use that as a heuristic there on forward? Or is this where every time we get new sales data, we're plugging this back into an online model that then gets, gets adapted? Or is this built into the product? And, and I think the world right now lives, unfortunately, bifurcated into either it's built into the product directly, and I'm doing a real online learning kind of mechanism, or it's completely this other ad hoc analysis mm -hmm. where you know, I do this one time, and then when I remember to, or I have time and resources to do this again, and I do that again. And I think you know, a big part of where we have to go is start bridging this gap. Uh, and, and that's frankly, I think, where the, the frontier is. Can, can I add one quick thing? Uh, are they answering your question? I think sorry, you were asking about the hype, the hype term, right? Um, I think um, I think that answered part of the question, um, but the, the 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 hype is 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 another part. So uh, it was kind of a complex question, um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think that definitely answered part of it. I think the hype term just makes everything more complex. Yeah, just my my, my 
don't uh, work hard to not uh, work hard to build models for which you are certain the metric matters to the business and the business has the appetite to actually tweak the knobs and levers that are going to impact that metric. There is no worse mistake than investing your precious time on a bad metric or a metric that you actually have no power to move. And that requires what he's saying. It's requiring the business context, but it requires really understanding, does your organization actually have the wherewithal and, and the iron gut to make these, these seemingly really tough choices? You had, I don't know you had a comment or no? Okay, next question. Yeah, so this is kind of a related question around, both around maybe hype and also sort of data science team structure. So if you're thinking, especially if you're small or medium-sized company, you hear like, oh man, I gotta get me some data science, I gotta get me some PhDs, right? And uh, so then you go and you try to hire up a bunch of PhDs, and then now what do you do, right? So I've also had cases where people are like, oh man, we've got SKLearn, we've got TensorFlow, we've got a bunch of engineering tools. I can just take engineers and point them at TensorFlow, and now I have machine learning. Both of those don't work. Um, so where, you know, do you have any recommendations for, for heuristics for people to think about, like, when is, when is what you need just engineers who can look at tools and sort of get a good sense of what they're trying to accomplish versus when you really do need to invest in someone who has maybe a very deep domain experience or is going to go off and maybe try to do another dissertation on your problem when that's maybe not what you want? Great question. I also go for it first. Yeah, so uh, there exists a very large set of problems for which people are reinventing the wheel. Uh, there exists uh, a fetishization about solving that problem because everybody wants to believe that their problem is special and magical somehow. Uh, uh, if your problem, if you feel like your problem already fits into something that when you Google if somebody's doing it, there's already a company in Crunchbase that got $22 million in funding to solve marketing analytics or people analytics or all of a sudden like that, you need to just, you need to just use what they're doing unless it's core to your business. Uh, the answer to me is when you look at the thing and you go, is this core to our uh, competitive advantage? Is this core to our identity as an organization? And only in that point, when it's actually core to your, uh, your identity as an organization, do you take the step back and go, okay, now is, is, it, is, is it something that is going to uh, be solved by slapping a couple of things together? Is it an engineering problem? Or is it literally something so unique to our competitive advantage that I need a PhD in physics? I need a brilliant person to actually look at this problem and think about it from ground up first practices. But it has to be, to me, like th there is no greater sin than hiring data scientists to work on problems that have already been solved and commercialized to the point that you could just put a credit card in a thing, point it at a, a web service, and be done with it. You know, adding on to that, I think you know, just my neighbor here uh, probably has solved your problem already. If it's, you know, <laughs> I mean, he's gone through so many of these, and and chances are that if you want to just beat this guy, you know, good luck. Um, it's probably going to take you quite a while. And and I think the real value here to really focus on is to figure out which of these many approaches are out there is actually appropriate for you. And I think it does. It, chances are exactly like you know uh, my friend here was, was saying. Unless you, this is very core to your business and you need to get hyper accurate towards it and the business requires that, there's fairly little justification to get that expert PhD who's going to be basically reinventing you know, exactly that problem that this guy's already done you know, a thousand times. I think the more important is just figuring out what is the right types of, uh, what is the right solution to be applying for that specific business problem and just go after that. So we, we've been getting great questions from the audience. We're also hitting our limit. Uh, I'd like us to try to wrap up in the next five minutes or so. I have a question and I have a, a general sort of summary uh, by each of you. Uh, so we'll take one more question after this one. But I want to direct the question uh, to Arno and, and Anthony, but everybody on the panel. Since we're talking hype and no panel today will be complete without the true mention of AI, do you, <laughs> do you think AI has anything to do to help with the process of data analysis? Like choice of algorithm, preparation of the data, attribute selection. Is, is there a role there or are we, are we okay with how we do it today? Do you want to start? So yeah, I think uh, automating those Kaggle minds is what needs to be done. That's, that's our next product. So we're working on automating their scripts, literally. We take the best people and their scripts and we make it robust and um, scalable and use GPUs to run it day and night. So you will build 10,000 models overnight that try different feature engineering and so on. So that kind of stuff is 
you could call it AI, right? But it's, it's not really a, a reinforcement learning neural net that learns to like make those features or something, but it could be. It, we use something that's even better than that in terms of need of data. You don't need like 10 million examples to, to figure out what's good or not. But for example, knowledge-based approach to selecting features, knowledge-based approach to processing yes. data. So it's, it's data-driven, right? right? So it builds a model, let's say, and it figures out what features matter. And then it goes and makes interactions out of those features or those clustering features that I mentioned earlier. Or it does a truncated SVD and then some space that is related to those features and expands them because of categoricals and then compact it and so on. Like it makes good features based on the data. And you can say that's an AI feature maker, but it's validating itself by using those GP algorithms hundreds of times um, an hour or something and it figures out what works and what doesn't. So it's a data-driven approach of automating those Kaggle ideas because you can't have one person say, mm, today let me try this, then I come home, you know, and then tomorrow I have another day and I have two months to solve this Kaggle problem. That might, you might not have that much time. So maybe you can afford 10 EC2 nodes with GPUs, each has eight GPUs or something, you just let it run and after a day or two you have an answer that's very good, right? So I think AI definitely has a place, if you want to call it AI, that's the only question. We call it driverless AI, so it's even two hype words in one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any other comments on yeah, this question? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think, I think the, the answer to your question is a clear yes. You know, I think there is a lot of room for AI in this. Uh, I mean, there's there's the immediate side uh, of, you know, you have a bunch of different approaches, select which one's most appropriate <laughs> given the, the context of your, your business problem, whatever, and I think I've been saying that a few too many times. Um, but I think that's an immediate kind of place for AI. And I think the, the other side of it also is that, I mean, even if you look at the procedure of how we revise our decisions right now, like right now, I think today's data science community lives as if we're all individual ninjas doing our own thing in, in isolation. And we're not talking about, hey, if we are in a larger group and we have a team of data scientists, or hell, we even have an organization that has had multiple people looking at similar problems. Are we improving based off of one person's behavior? Are we codifying this and modifying that decision, uh, kind of making that, whether that model or modifying whatever we're doing towards that? And, now, I think the second that we can start measuring that and seeing how these models have been changing, there's a lot of room for AI. You know, just like any, I mean, if you look at how Facebook recommends which groups you should be joining, you know, it's a very classic AI problem, uh, machine learning problem, uh, where you can start looking at human behavior of how have people been responding to the suggestions previously? How have people been uh, changing their decisions based off of the factors that have been suggested? You know, imagine that with modeling. If you can see how people have been making their decisions and whether we're tailoring these models to be more accurate in one dimension or another, selecting other kind of principles, I think that's a very rich field for, for AI to be helping out with improving uh, even how we do the practice of data modeling. Well, one last audience question. I think somebody has the mic. This one. Um, but one last one. Okay. And by the way, we'll be here, so you can ask us separately. I just want to don't, don't want to keep everybody around. It's a very interesting set of questions, by the way, so keep them up. All right. So if this is the last one, then hopefully it's an easy one. We talked um, no, it's very. Supposed to be the best one. Yeah, please. So um, we talked very briefly in the very beginning that um, as like a data scientist, you're going through and every step of the way, you're creating some temporary files and leaving your droppings. And then either the next guy has to pick through your droppings or uh, make them up on his own. Now, as a PhD student, I've already had to, you know, I've lost my data files and I've got, you know, the like n times m models versus hyperparameters that I'm trying to figure out and the amount of, you know, data complexity kind of skyrockets. So is there a solution to kind of managing all of these uh, temporary files, temporary data sets? Um, that I'm not aware of? Is there something that um, might be, because this is a problem that I feel like we've solved in source code with version control, but I'm left with writing like data.final.final.really. <laughs> uh, very good, so I think there's a company that does this too. <laughs> no, no. No, okay. uh, no, so uh, what I was gonna say is, so, uh, 
you should check out Domino Data Lab. Uh, <laughs> literally, the fundamental idea is that source control is part of it, but the tuple of data science is broader. It's the code, it's the environment, uh, it's the packages, it's the data, it's all of this thing put together in one. Uh, I was going to say it has, uh, you know, uh, Domino Data Lab is a company that's trying to solve it. It does so uh, uh, pretty well. There are some other open source packages out there that are trying to solve it. But, but the answer is, uh, yeah, absolutely. You need a system of record. You need these things searchable. You need them replaceable. It makes no sense that you've got a dot old dot foo dot back dot use this one. Uh, and GitHub should solve it, except for the fact that GitHub hates data and it doesn't actually tie your code to executions. And then you've got that problem. It's like, oh, I didn't commit when I had that model that actually was the model I wanted. And I totally forgot to like git commit at that point. Um, not, not to turn this into a pitch, but you should absolutely check out Domino Data Lab if that's a problem that you and, have. And by the way, to be uh, to to uh, Eduardo's credit, he was at Domino Data Labs when I met him and invited him. He has since, of course, being a hot data scientist, got a much hotter offer from Facebook. So he's now at Facebook. So we can treat his uh, recommendation as a bit unbiased, even though I'm sure he's still. <laughs> <laughs> ah, do you have a free product for students. Uh, Domino for Good is a program that was started while I was there that if uh, it is free for academic use with some constraints, obviously. But if you're a grad student, go check it out. Uh, and just to throw it on here, H2O runs amazingly well on it. You should absolutely be using that as well. <laughs> any, any other comments or? Yeah, also as Eduardo mentioned uh, that uh, there are uh, some open source uh, frameworks uh, that you can use, uh, Pike, um, uh, Pet, Pachyderm is uh, one um, that does version control on like models and uh, data files, and um, you can also use um, a model DB developed by MIT. Uh, that is uh, a little limited to scikit-learn type of models, uh, but still, uh, if that's uh, your go-to tools, then you can utilize that. Um, also, as a like bigger framework, um, uh, Microsoft has uh, developed and open sourced the. Uh, a process framework called uh, Team Data Science Process, uh, um, so that you can check out that. Um, in um, like uh, Domino Data Lab, uh, as well as uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, has a lot of exciting uh, features uh, uh, around data science process as well. So, what was uh, the name of the open source package? Uh, Pachyderm. Pachyderm. D R M. Pachyderm.io. All yeah. right. Pachyderm.io. A good student should start there. <laughs> um, I, think, I think we're running out of time. Unless there's an urgent question, I'd like to have, give each panelist 10 to 20 seconds to share a uh, parting wisdom with the audience based on the interactions, the previous talks, etc. You know, what are your thoughts, reflections, and any wisdoms you want to share with the, with the audience? And we'll keep it short to the point. All right, get a GitHub account. Get a Kaggle account and download H2O. <laughs> <laughs> and at the very least, get TensorFlow, get SKLearn, get the basic tools, buy a GPU box, and just start playing. If you don't do it yourself, you'll never like actually feel how it is to be involved in all this field. Right? Interesting. You said buy a GPU box rather than instantiate it on the cloud. I like the idea of, of knowing what a computer does, right? Installing your own Linux on it and so on. Get your hands dirty. Like, don't just use yeah. make. I've had, I've had problems with GPUs on AWS, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, my, the, my wisdom is probably boring, but take good notes. Uh, literally every step of this process from the moment that you query a database to the moment that you put a model in production is fraught with incredible peril. And you have to take good notes about what you've done. You have to create reusable things that you've done. You have to look back upon them and understand why you did the things that you did and why you won't make the same mistakes again. Be principled. Nice. So don't believe anything. <laughs> <laughs> anything was said on this panel either. <laughs> so to be more serious, actually, yeah, think critically. So there is a lot of hype you want to see through the hype. So what, what's real? But it's kind of hard, right? Yeah, um, A, B, C, always be curious. So uh, curious about uh, how other data science scientists are doing, curious about what new developments are available out there, curious about like how other domain experts uh, are uh, using the data in a different way than um, any data scientists uh, do. Um, 
Despite what hype may want you to believe, uh, deep learning is one of many techniques in machine learning. And you, know, you should not be spending all of your time using the same tool for every single problem. Um, find the right tool uh, for, for whatever problems you're looking for. And it's not always going to be deep learning. It's not always going to be one thing versus another. So just find the right tool for the right problem. OK. Uh, I'm not sure if this panel has helped us sort of get out of the mess of uh, uh, the processes and all of that. However, please join me uh, in thanking the panel for excellent uh, answers.